machine man has yet devised. Wing wonders that weigh only 1,250 pounds and have 700 horsepower. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Evans, and welcome to a blustery day at Devil's Bowl Speedway in Mesquite, Texas. And I'll tell you one thing for sure. If push comes to shove, outlaws like Shane Carson, well, they'll do both. Okay, Paul, bump them off. But, Brock, I got one question. Why would you build a $50,000 race car that won't even start itself? Okay, Steve, let me ask you a question. Why would some of the best sprint car drivers in the world show up at a little windswept racetrack outside Dallas, Texas? I'll tell you why. This is a world of outlaws, and these guys will race anywhere, as long as it's on dirt. We're going to see some of the very best in the business today. Sammy Swindell, Steve Kinzer, Brad Doty, Ron Schumann. They're all here for some real wheel-to-wheel -wheel action, a world of outlaw style. And Brock Devil's Bowl is kind of an interesting racetrack. It's a little short of a half a mile, and there's an elevation change between the front straightaway and the back straightaway. Right, Steve. As a matter of fact, the back straight's about 15 feet higher than the front, so you drive up through one and two, down through three and four. Otherwise, pretty uncomplicated racetrack, but there is one unexpected element here. Well, as you can tell by the flags on this state-of-the-art flagpole, the wind is blowing pretty good here today at Devil's Bowl. The weatherman says 30 miles an hour steady with gusts to 40. Now, the drivers have the wind at their back coming down the front straightaway, and they're head on into it on the back side. I asked some of them, how is this wind going to affect the handling of their machine? Well, it's uh, quite a bit different from one end to the other. Uh, going into three, you can run in wide open, and really, you don't even have to hardly even turn the car in. If you just kind of help it into the corner, the wind will turn it. And then on the other end, you have to go in kind of slow and uh, be pretty hard on the brakes because uh, if you don't, it'll carry, the wind will carry you right off the end. Well, the biggest problem we're going to have, I think, is going into turn three. When you start down the hill into turn three, the wind will be blowing into the car, and as the car turns and the side panel becomes exposed to the wind, it's going to blow the car down real hard on the left side. You probably see a lot of cars getting down on the left hard enough to where they might spin out. Uh, it's making, right now, it's making the cars a little bit wormy. Uh, we just got to make chassis adjustments for it, you know, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Wormy? Well, yeah, it just kind of dances all around in the middle of the corner and stuff. It just, it's just, you know, so sometimes the gusts get up to about 30 miles an hour, and it just, with, this, with a 4 by 8 sheet of, like, aluminum on the sideboard, it just, you know, it catches the wind, and it, it makes it do some phenomenal things, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, these things do phenomenal things even when the wind isn't blowing. This is a 10-lap qualifying heat. That's five miles here at Devil's Bowl, and four of these cars will advance to the feature later in the day, Steve, and that's where the big payday is, 8,000 to win. $20,000 total, but you've got to earn your way into that feature. As you said, four will come out of each heat race. Also, four will come out of the consolation. Once you make the main event, your starting position is determined by qualifying time laps held earlier. And in addition, four of the outlaws are seated into today's feature uh, because of their success yesterday in preliminary action. That is Steve Kenser, uh, Bobby Allen, Brad Doty, and Ron Schumann. So they don't have to worry about it. But one of the big stories here is Sammy Swindell, one of the very best of the outlaws. He's going to have to work his way up just like all the rest of the guys. Looks like we got a green out, Steve. We do indeed. And it is one. F.T. Chuck Hodgenstall from Ohio leading them down the front straight and into turn number one. There's Hodgenstall out in front. Well, Hodgenstall is one of the really quick young drivers in this league. He's about 29 years old. Comes from a sprint car racing family. There is a good, good race for second. There's Sammy. Wendell's younger brother, Jeff, in that 91 car, trying to get underneath Oklahoma City, Shane Carson. Now, Jeff Wendell debuted his 91 car yesterday, a brand new machine, and the first time that Jeff has campaigned his own team, and he is underneath Shane Carson. There he goes, into second place, down the back straightaway. Jeff Wendell, really one of the young hot shoes from uh, the Memphis, Tennessee group of racers, Sammy, Bobby Davis Jr., a bunch of good drivers out of that area. And here's a battle for the fourth spot, 11A, Joe Clay, the yellow car, followed by Sheldon Kinder, 3K, uh, Lee Brewer, and Greg Woolley from Oklahoma City. Well, you notice that Lee Brewer lost his front wing there uh, as uh, Kinder just nipped underneath him. He's front wing. Oh, look at that. That was Joe Clay. He got real crossed up. Oh, loose. Now, that's the area where that wind is sweeping across that turn three and four area, Steve, that uh, the guy Tim Green talked about earlier. And I, it may be that that's the problem that uh, he had right there. Now, four go to the main. Lee Brewer just slid into the fifth spot. He's got to get one more position to be assured of a start in the future. Well, there's Jeff Swindell trying to catch up on uh, Jack Hodgenshaw, but he's not doing much in the way of carrying that distance. And here is the crucial battle for that fourth position. 3K Sheldon gets on the outside. 1F Lee Brewer on the inside. Here goes Kenser. He's around on the high tech. Can he make it work? No. It is burned out underneath him. Good race, 
grooves there. This racetrack has a couple of grooves, as you can see, as Kinzer and Brewer both try the low side on uh, turn one and two, but you can run high here, too. Notice there are no fences at uh, Devil's Ball, so if you get a little wide, you can try to go out and drive around in the mesquite for a while and come back on the track. Pretty forgiving racetrack. <laughs> it is. Until you get one of these things upside down. That is Sheldon Kinzer. He's kind of the senior member of the Kinzer clan of racing uh, folks. They build engines, build cars, and race, of course. Uh, the greatest one of them all, the best known, certainly, Steve Kinzer, is a cousin of Sheldon Kinzer. Kinzer, this one, has run in Indianapolis a couple of times. A fine driver in his own right. Our leader there, Doug Hodgenstrahl, has had a pretty easy time of it here. So we have not seen him display the bravado that he's capable of. His reputation is for driving on sheer gut. Well, they call him the wild child, and uh, he really is a fine race driver, very brave. Notice he just slides that race car almost all the way around Devil's Bowl. Very seldom gets the wheel straightened up, except for a little bit on the front and the back shoe. But the cars are run really on the throttle. Uh, just to pitch them into the corner and use that throttle to drive them through. And Hyde Child's really good. Last lap coming up, one half mile to victory here and to assure him of a place in the feature later in the day. And that's the one thing everybody wants to accomplish, but get to that feature the easiest way possible. The last thing anybody wants to do is fail at the heat and have to get into the consolation and be in the top four there. Just more laps on the car. And a lot of hairier driving. And Jack Hodenschild from Millersburg, Ohio, takes the first seat here at Devil's Ball. We'll see him later in the main event. Our fans have come from all over the Southwest. The Devil's Bowl Speedway today for the world of outlaw action. Jock Hodden shall won heat number one. Sheldon Gensler was fifth, so he did not transfer to the main event. He'll have to run the country. Brock is with the winner. Well, Jack, that was an easy way to start the day off. Yeah, the car's feeling pretty good, and uh, I think we're getting a little closer, and I think it's going to be all right by main time. How about the wind? Uh, a lot of people are commenting on it. Let's say he wants to push you off between one and two, and then it really buries you pretty good coming off of four. Yeah, you can you can feel it down the back of you a little bit moving the car around, but it's, it's not really that much of a problem. Do you change the wing angle at all? Yeah, lower it down a little bit. So you're going to get it ready for the feature? Yeah, we should be looking pretty good for the main. Okay. Okay. An interesting man, young Jack Hodenchild. Small of frame, but with a heart as big as a lion. And now let's go to Steve Evans with the second place finisher, Jeff Wendell. Well, Jeff, were you uh, trying to catch Houses Child or just stay in front of Jane Carson? Well, scored out there. He got started on the front row and he got to take off pretty good there. We got into second. I felt we was catching him just a little bit, but, you know, it's really hard to make up that much ground that short of time. So I just kind of wanted to stay where I was at, try not to use up the tires too much, and uh, just try to take out because all we had to do was run a top four. So, uh, you know, that was the best thing to do at the time. Well, you accomplished that. Good job. Thank you very much. Just Wendell, 25 years old, from Memphis, Tennessee. As we said earlier, the younger brother of the more famous, perhaps, and a little bit older, Sammy Swindell, as he checks over right now the tire wear. That's a critical factor here at Devil's Ball. And here we see heat number two setting up on the pole, as it were. The inside of row one is Tim G, who comes all the way from the Yukon Territory in Canada. Jimmy Sills at number nine from Sacramento, California, one of the better drivers in this particular league. Rocky Hodges from Des Moines, Iowa. We saw him a couple of years ago. Remember at Syracuse, New York, run almost 140 miles an hour on a flat mile dirt track, Steve. In fact, he set the world record, which we saw later reset by Sammy Swindell. 410 cubic inch aluminum racing engines. They run an alcohol fuel, fuel injected, of course. And the wings are limited to 25 square feet, and that's about all the rules there are. Anytime you're around an oval track, you'll hear the word stagger. It has nothing to do with equilibrium, as Brock explained earlier. Stagger is a word you usually associate with the bar rooms and New Year's Eve parties, but not so in sprint car racing or in racing of all kinds for that matter. Stagger is the phrase used to differentiate the size and tire circumferences. Now notice this sprinter of Brad Doty's. The left rear tire is substantially smaller than the right rear. As a matter of fact, the left rear is a circumference of about 94 inches. It's mounted on a 12-inch rim. But over here on the right side, look at the size of this. They used to call this a humper. Now it's just called a dirt tire. But this thing is 104 inches in circumference, mounted on an 18-inch rim. Now this tire, of course, takes the brunt of the cornering power on a small, short dirt track like this, where all the corners, of course, are left-handed. So the right side tire 
carrying about six pounds of air, that's all. The left side, about four pounds, is the critical factor here. And you're going to see a lot of tire wear at the Devil's Ball as this tire really fries coming off the corner. Well, the Outlaws, as you well know, Brock, primarily run night shows. Anytime there's a day race, they were really challenged by the racetrack conditions. It doesn't stay kind of moist and gooey like a will at night. It'll get more like asphalt. We've got a green flag here on heat number two, Steve. Indeed, we do, and Tim T on the inside of the front row will lead them uphill out of turn one into turn number two. Wide open through turn number two. High line, low line, everybody all over the racetrack, down the back straightaway, and there is Steve Perry in the number eight car, challenging G on the outside, coming off turn four, Steve. Oh, and Perry passes decisive. He just says goodbye to G. The yellow car, 88M Mike Ward, is now in the third spot. Well, Steve, he is, uh, we got a couple of 88s in this race, both G and Ward carrying that number, but there goes Ward breaking loose from Tim G in that white 88. The yellow one is Ward, and now he's going to try to challenge Perry for the lead. That's right, Ward is in the second position now. We've got a good fight for the lead. Here comes Ward on the outside, and he is not going to make that one work. Well, that's a high line off that corner, but he's got him, it looks like, yeah. And here are the results of the second heat. Mike Ward won it. Remember, Rocky Hodges came out of the middle of the pack to take second. And now, let's go to Steve with the winner. Well, Mike, a good job, but the wind looked like it was buffeting you around a little bit. Yeah, the wind's pretty bad out there. It's bouncing around pretty bad in three and four. And the wind also tends to dry out the racetrack, which is no big help, right? Uh, no, not really. It's dry, make it real hard on tires. Uh, the it gets right now, there, I'm going to like it. Is that right? For what reason? Uh, we got a pretty nice slick track combination, and uh, it's just just working great right now. Well, we'll see how it works in the main event, won't we? I hope so. <laughs> I hope we're up there. Brock for second place. Well, Rocky, you and uh, Steve Perry were hammering on each other pretty hard all the way, but you finally got by him. Where, where did it happen? I, I don't even remember which corner it happened on, uh, but I don't know. It came up pretty fast here, don't yeah, they? Yeah, it did. <laughs> we, I was on the top, you know, and I was had a pretty much you know, clear sailing to myself up there, and the track's dry and had a little bit of a cushion up there, and my car was really set up for that. 
I tried running the bottom early and it just didn't work, so I moved up and it was really nice. So, oh, I think we put on a pretty exciting race for the people. Oh, you sure did. <laughs> Everybody uh, was standing on their feet up in the old grandstands. What about, what do you reckon uh, is going to happen when they get uh, you get to the main? Is it the groove going to move up on the racetrack? I noticed a lot of guys are trying to run low and seem to be up uh, hooking it uh, up on the berm all the way around. Well, the top's going to slow down in, in corner one and two. In three and four, I think we're going to be able to run the top, though. I think it's going to be stay there pretty much all day. You going to change the card off? Oh, other than a little bit harder tires to, to withstand 30 laps, uh, that's about all the change we're going to make. Okay, well, I hope it works for you. Thanks, Rocky. Thank you. Well, from what Rocky said, it sounds like we can look forward to a very competitive racetrack this afternoon. Here is heat number three setting up. Bobby Davis Jr., very competitive young man from Memphis, Tennessee. Joe Garrity, son of famed engine builder Earl Garrity. You know, he's got a lot of horsepower. And one of four Kinsers here today, Randy Kinzer in heat number three. Right. Remember, we saw the senior racing member of the clan, Sheldon Kinzer, uh, run so well in that first heat. And later in the day, we're going to see the most famous of them all, Steve. Over the years, we've seen a lot of development, fortunately, in the crash helmet area. But one outlaw had a particular problem that he had to solve personally. Brock looked at it earlier. If you're going to run with a world of outlaws, you better be prepared to eat a little dirt because, as you know, it's all dirt racing from coast to coast. But if you've got an allergy, like Ron Schumann has, that could be a problem. He cannot take the dust. He's got a bronchial condition, and it requires a special helmet. Now, what he has done is adapted his Bell helmet a little deal called Fresh Air System, which is specially built. It was started for the off-road guys in the Baja and the Mint 400, where it's even dustier in a dirt race. What Ron has is a little connector here, electrical connection with a battery pack in this cockpit, and it drives a little defroster motor. It's got a filter on this thing, feeds fresh air in, and then exhausts out right around his face. So he is picking up fresh air all through the race. In addition to the benefits of getting fresh air, He's got kind of a little defroster in there that keeps his visor from fogging up. So it's a neat setup, and I would imagine you're going to see more of these as the outlaws expand their schedule. And we'll see Ron Schumann don that very unique helmet for the feature race today. He was seated in to the main event by uh, virtue of his success yesterday. Right now, we got 10 laps of racing in heat number three. Remember, the top four go to the main event. All right, off the pole, that is Ted Lee in the number 37 T car, but right now it's Bobby Davis Jr. who dove right past him in turn number one to take that lead. And I'll tell you what, Steve, this young man really shoes a sprint car. If anybody overtakes him in this group of guys, it'll be amazing. Bobby Davis Jr. is really, I would say right now, the class of this field. Indeed, but what a battle we've got for the second spot. 37T, Ted Lee, followed by four, Joe Garrity, and three, Danny Smith. Three good drivers right there, too, and uh, there's Joe Garrity in that number four car going high to get around the number three car, Danny Smith. So Smith hanging on there, but Joe Garrity right now has opened up a little bit of distance on him and has Ted Lee in his sight. And red number three there, Danny Smith. Uh, he's getting pressure from 7X Randy Smith for his fourth position. Now, Steve, you notice that both the Smith boys there, no relation, by the way, are running up on top, as Rocky Hodges said, between turns three and four. They're running down in the bottom in that wide turn number one and two. But the cushion is being created on the outside of uh, turns three and four, and that's where they're riding up there. And as you mentioned earlier, Brock, this track is more and more starting to resemble asphalt as it dries out and becomes more abrasive. There you can see a blue groove condition developing. Well, one of the secrets of sprint car racing is the ability to read a racetrack and to set the car up for what will be changing conditions. Certainly the 30-lap uh, feature race, and we'll see later, is going to have a totally different racing surface than what they've got right now. And the secret is to set the wing angles, pick the tire compound, set the chassis for the race that comes up. And as the conditions change over 30 laps, they can be radically different at the end than they are at the beginning. And oftentimes the guy that guesses right is the winner. Well, Danny Smith, the red number three, starting to pick up the pace. He is going after Garrity in the third spot. It is Garrity with the big yellow wing and the four on it. Well, you notice that Danny got down low a little bit and then scrubbed off some speed. He had to kind of get out of the throttle, and that gave Joe a chance to just uh, drive away from there a little bit. He lost quite a bit of time. There he comes again, having at him one more time. Again, Danny trying to get underneath him, but Joe doing a good job. His car's hooked up pretty well, and look at this. He moves out to about a five-car length lead uh, in that, for that 
that position down the back straight. Well, one thing riding high will do for you, you keep the engine RPMs up, you get the tire spinning just a little bit coming out of that turn, and you can launch down the straight. Right. Look at that uh, tire smoke come off of that right rear tire of Joe Garrity. That's just uh, hooked up traction right there. 700 horsepower working. There goes Danny Smith trying him on the outside now. Danny seems to get off turn four a little bit better than Joe, but Joe gets off turn two better. And here comes number six, Bobby Davis Jr. on a turn number four, going for the checkered flag. But the real fight is for that third spot between Joe Garrity and Danny Smith. Smith on the outside, the red number three. But now he ducks inside. What a race for that third position. Danny Smith got him. Beautiful move by Danny Smith. Goes high and then cut underneath Joe to just clip him at the checkered flag. So. Bobby Davis Jr., one of the Memphis gang, dominates the third heat, but the big show is between Danny Smith and Joe Garrity. We'll be back with more from the Devil's Ball. Well, the Outlaw Sprinters are putting on quite a show here at Devil's Ball of Mesquite, Texas today. That's Tim Green getting ready for heat number four. As far as heat number three is concerned, those results have been posted. And, of course, it was Bobby Davis Jr. winning it. The real fun race to watch was Danny Smith and Joe Garrity. Brock right now is with the winner, Bobby Davis Jr. Is the wind affecting the race cars as much as it looks like it might be? Yeah, it's affecting them real bad, like going down a back straightaway and getting in the tree down there. Uh, I want to shake you around quite a bit, but uh, other than that, it's going to slow down a little bit more, so other than that, it's, it's not too bad. Do you think the racetrack's going to slow up a little bit? Well, it's slow right now, but when I'm, if it gets rubber on the ground, I think it'll get faster. Okay, well, I hope you get the right setup for the feature. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Remember Danny Smith and that great third place capture? Steve's with him. Danny, that was a nice piece of driving to pull off that third place on the last lap. Oh, a little bit of luck, lap cars, and I, I didn't figure the corner out on one and two until the last lap. It's starting to get rubber down the middle, and it's getting stickier, and I was going in real low, trying to stay down tight. It was still glazy down there, and I was getting real loose, and uh, watching them guys in front of me, a couple laps ago, I moved up in the middle and got a good run off the two on the last lap and then had a good run off the four and uh, a couple lap cars in the way and uh, Joe we really wasn't that concerned we was yeah. in the transfer spot so it really didn't mean that much other than to pass the guy. Good show. All right thanks. But I don't think Joe enjoyed it quite as much as Randy did yeah. right Brock? Well Joe I'll tell you what that's what the fans came to see what you and Danny Smith put on here that was a super race. Yeah uh, we got I kind of got loose down here towards the end of the race and he kind of caught up to me there towards the end but it's good close racing, you know, and all four of us made it in the show, so. Uh, you starting to, it looks like you were looking at the right rear. Were you starting to go away on you a little bit? Yeah, we, uh, we're going to have to go with a harder tire. It's going to start using tires pretty bad today. Yeah, everybody, uh, everybody said that, uh, that we've talked to said they're going to go to a harder compound for the main. Yeah, we're going to go with a, just a little bit harder. We chose a soft one thinking we could get a good starting spot, you know, and then just kind of hold on towards the end of the race there. So what you'll do is uh, is uh, probably everybody run a little bit slower for the first four or five laps of the main until they get those tires uh, scrubbed in, and then they'll start really roaring, huh? Yeah, that's what it looks like. You're going to have to take it easy the first few laps till you get some heat in your tires, and then, you know, go for it. Well, I hope it works for you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Well, that's not the last we'll hear of tire talk because picking the right tire is every bit as important as having uh, the right amount of horsepower on a racetrack like this. This is heat number four. The final shot at qualifying for that main event. And a couple of big names in this. Tim Green, who we saw win here at Devil's Bowl a couple of years ago. And Sammy Swindell, two-time king of the outlaws. Right, Steve. And Sammy is in this heat based on the fact that he got spun out in the feature race yesterday and finished back in 14th spot. So uh, he's going to have to work his way through the field. Some of the other hot shoes, uh, Steve Kinzer, Brad Doty, Bobby Allen, they finished well enough based on qualifying in their finishes yesterday. So they don't have to run the heat. They're going to sit by in the old infield on top of their trailers and watch the rest of the guys struggle. And we've got a green. That's went down on that the red number one in the second row. Watch him. Everybody, oh, and we have got contact on the front straight. One, two, three cars involved here. A chain reaction crash right at the start. The yellow toxic flag is out for sure. Number 52, Steve Laney in that yellow car up against the fence along with Dean Lindsay. Jack Hewitt in the 63 out in the middle of the straightaway. The cars will slow down and reform. You know, Steve, it's possible they can restart these guys. These cars are like little hunks of billet steel. They're really strong. But then again, it's possible they suffered some suspension damage. It looked as if Laney got up against the fence pretty hard, and he may have some problems. But uh, who's to know? They may get 
underway again. Let's take another look at it. And I think we'll see what caused this chain reaction. Watch the white car, Tim Green, 5M. He comes up high, right there. He just tagged for Steve Lane. He puts him right into the wall. Jack Hewitt, the 63 car, he had nowhere to go. From another angle now, you will see the yellow car. That's Laney sliding up towards the wall. And Tim Green just grazes his left front wheel. But it's enough to point him towards the wall. Poor Jack Hewitt had nowhere to go but to hit him. Well, it's just one of those little incidents in real close racing like you get in Outlaws on half-mile dirt tracks. It wasn't Tim Green's fault by any means. It's just that two guys try to be in the same spot at the same time. That's all. Well, Crewman are on the scene with the sledgehammers and the crowbar is going to try to get these cars back into the race. Gene Lindsay's machine looks repairable. The car with the most damage is number 52, Steve Laney, and Brock is with Steve to find out. Well, Steve, it looks like there's kind of a dispute about uh, how that all happened. Where, where, how do you see it? Well, I see it two times in a row. Tim Green just skated out and pinned me on the fence. That's the only way I can see it. Uh -huh. So you were you're coming off a four, and uh, you just got up against the fence. He had nowhere to go. He will ne he won't let you have a place to go. Right. There. Are you all right? Yes, sir. Fine. Hurt the race car bad? Yeah, tore it up pretty good. Well, we're sorry you're out. Well, thank you very much. Glad you're okay. Thank you. Now let's go to Steve with one of the other drivers involved, Jack Hewitt. Well, Jack, can we get back in this thing? Yeah, we just really didn't get bumped too much. We just uh, kind of spun to miss everything, and we just kind of rubbed the wheel. That old deal aim for the spinning car, and maybe you won't hit him, huh? Yeah, well, I don't think we're going to hit him no more. He's not going to be in the rest of this race. It looked like he just got into the wall and turned him sideways. I think he bumped somebody, or somebody bumped him, and I don't think that last one was his fault. <laughs> well, glad to see your right side up and getting back in it. Thank you. And Brock with yet another guy involved, Dean Lindsay. Just a quick word, Dean. Are you gonna? Are you out, or you try to repair the front wing? I know. Well, we'll try to repair the front end of the car, and then we'll make the B main. I hope. Well, we're sorry you're out. I hope you get back. Yeah. Okay. Well, two out of three getting back in it really isn't bad considering uh, what could have happened, Brock. <laughs> right, Steve. Like I said, they build these sprinters really tough. Now let's take one last look at that uh, little uh, spin here at the start of heat number four at Devil's Ball. That is Laney up against the fence. Tim Green just nicks his left front wheel. He's sideways up against the wall, and there's Jack Hewitt spinning out as well. But, as we said, two out of three back into it, and that's not bad considering what might have happened. Well, I don't think Tim Green will be getting a Christmas card from Steve Laney this year. <laughs> You're right, I doubt it. Okay, they're out circulating the racetrack under yellow, getting ready for a restart of heat number four here at the Devil's Bowl. Stick with us. The Outlaws will be back. Well, they're going to take another shot at getting heat number four underway. Number 63, Jack Hewitt, Brock Gates, is back in it. Good for him. He sure is. Jack, a really good-natured driver and a good guy, he runs the USAC circuit as well as the Outlaws and is a very solid talent. He's in it, but the big story really in this heat is Sammy Swindell. Remember yesterday, Steve, he was uh, fighting it out for the overall lead with uh, Steve Kinzer in the feature race appeared to be a sure second place finisher he got into some traffic here we are in turn number one and you can see swindell there and number 78 todd kane right in front of him spins sammy tries to go to the outside and just nicks his left rear wheel on kane's rear tire and takes himself out he was running pretty hard at that point steve he almost kind of did a wheel stand before he came to a stop it just reared up like a bucking horse didn't it were it not for that incident, we would uh, not see Sammy Swindell today until the feature. As it stands right now, he has got to be in the top four of this final heat race. If he's not, then he'd have to go to the Constellation, and no one remembers the last time Swindell was seen in a Constellation race. All <laughs> right. Absolutely. As we watch him come off turn four, the green is out. Mark Kinzer has the lead, but right there, look at this. Sammy Swindell ducks underneath uh, Ed French to take the second spot. That was just classic Swindell. Now he goes after Mark Kinzer. Anytime you're chasing a guy with a surname of Kinzer, you know he's not going to be easy to get. <laughs> he's the youngest of the clan, but boy, driving like a real veteran right now and managing to hold off Sammy Swindell. Swindell, though, slowly moving in on him and may take him down in turn three. Oh, look at this great report, Steve. That is 5M Tim Green, uh, who was involved in that earlier accident. 63 Jack Hewitt behind him and 56 Rick Hood. Ed French is in front of that formation, running in the third slot. But right behind him, three guys with big reputations, Green, Hood, and Hewitt. And there goes Hood challenging a Green down into turn number three, Steve. No, he can't make it stick. 
So Tim Green holds on to that fourth spot. Tim Green loves to stay down in that low groove all the way around the racetrack if he can do it. And here are the leaders again. Mark Kenzer, the white car out in front of the beautiful red number one is Sammy Swindell. Now you notice that both of them are running kind of a middle groove. They're kind of running down in the bottom through, through turns one and two and kind of mid-track in three and four. But both of them are running the same basic pattern here. Now Ed Brent is being threatened for that third spot. Tim Green coming up on him, Brick Hood, and Jack Hewitt as well. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of tire wear we get off of this uh, particular heat because this racetrack is really a nap ball hard right now. And look on the inside, that is Tim Green 5M getting by and press any way he can. Green is really aggressive. He is. And Jack Hewitt got a little sideways coming off there, too. He may have to get out of the throttle figure one more time there with uh, trouble with Green. All right, there is a big challenge by Sammy Swindell on Kinzer, but he can't make it stick. These guys are really having at it. Sammy may be holding back a little bit, just trying to save that right rear tire. Look at this. He slowed down, Steve. Swindell has got a flat right rear tire. It is just spreading all over the racetrack. In fact, Sammy Swindell is slowing on the back straightaway. There's too much of this race left for him to limp it into the pit. He just spins it out. That brings out the yellow. A destroyed right rear tire. And of course, that is the weak link in these race cars. The most important component in a lot of ways is that particular tire. So Swindell may well find himself in the consolation later today. That's incredible. The number one car is out of his heat. And what does that number on Swindell's wing mean? Earlier, Brock tried to find out. The car you see there is the number one sprinter of Sammy Swindell. Now, it would make sense that Sammy would carry car number one. He's the former World of Outlaws champion and the second winningest driver in the history of the World of Outlaws. But believe it or not, he's only one of six car number ones here at Devil's Bowl. So you kind of wonder what the people up in the scoring stand do with a whole bunch of duplicate numbers. Well, they just make do because this is the Outlaws. And like a lot of things you do in this sport, you can run any number you want. <laughs> and that's not the only number duplicated here. Well, there's Wendell. He is in the pit headed for his truck and a new right rear tire. But he's not going to have time to get into heat number four because the green flag is back out. And look at Mark Kenzer with just two laps to go. He slings it into turn number two. And he's got to be breathing a whole lot easier now that that uh, beautiful red number one car isn't sitting right on his nerf bar. Good race for a second as Ginger appears to be a certain victor. But right now it's Tim Green, Jack Hewitt, and Terry Gray just battling it out for that runner-up spot. Indeed. Now Jack Hewitt as they come down into turn number three. Let's see what kind of a move he tries to put on Green. He's going to go high on Tim Green. Of course, Mark is going to go on to win it, but this is the race right now. Hewitt goes way up in the marble, maybe got up in the loose stuff a little bit and couldn't make it stick. So uh, Tim Green comes on home in second place. Jack finishes in third. Right behind him, Terry Gray. And Ed French, who, remember, started on the pole, comes home in fifth. Unfortunately, not good enough. Only four cars transfer to the feature. All right, there are a couple of Swindell's crewmen completing uh, the bowling down the beadlock on his right rear tire. Steve is with his car owner. Well, Brock, I'm with Raymond Beadle, car owner for Sammy Swindell. And Raymond, I know uh, once a year you look forward to running in front of the hometown fans, and something has definitely gone wrong here today. Well, definitely, we always like to do good, you know, here at home in Dallas. We don't we've run here that often. Fortunately, last time we were here, we won, but then the days have a little bit of problems. But now he has to run the B, but like we were talking earlier, sometimes that can be an advantage. He'll get a little better feel of the track going into the A, so he has to finish in the top four, which we're pretty certain he'll do that. Well, the tire we saw come off the car was not worn out. It was cut. Yeah, he looked like he ran over something had about a six-inch gap in the tire, and I mean, that's unfortunate, but they had three or four restarts, but they always have to be on the front. Well, from what I can see in the trailer, Sammy Swindell is no prima donna. He's in there busting tires with the guys. Yeah, well, he's trying real hard right now, and like I said, we're having to mount up an extra set of tires because we weren't planning on running this big uh, feature, and he is getting all ready for the A, but we think we'll be ready. Yeah, we look forward to seeing the Blue Max Funny car this season, and of course, the NASCAR car of yours also. Thank you. Hope we're there. Okay, let's go to Brock with the winner of heat number four, Mark Kinzer. Well, Mark, I guess if you'd had a rearview mirror in that thing, you would have seen all that going on behind you, but you kind of stayed out front and avoided all the trouble. Yeah, the car's hooked up real good. We had a little tire wear. I noticed uh, me and Sammy got into a pretty good race there, and he had a flat. I don't know if he wore it out or what, but uh, track's getting to where it's eating a little tires. We're going to make a few changes. Hope to be in there for the feature. Everybody talking about going to a lot harder compound for the main, huh? Oh, yeah, we went from a 40 to 60, which is a pretty good change. 
Well, I hope it works for you. Okay, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank Good you. Job. Well, often the consolation in this kind of racing is kind of a whole hum affair. It's not going to be when we come back. Sammy Swindell is in a must-win situation. A new right rear tire being bolted on the number one car as the crew prepares it for the consolation. Brock is with Jack Hewitt, who had a lot better luck at heat number four than Sammy Swindell did. Well, Jack... Uh from the jaws of defeat is it where you got back made the main anyway that was uh, i bet you were reckoning when you're sitting on the sidelines that it wasn't going to work that way huh yeah well we just kept struggling you know uh after sammy dropped out ricky and i before he did i hit uh, ricky back there and lost a lot of time i about spun and, uh, and then terry gray got me and boy for a minute i was concerned but uh <laughs> not how fast it's how far a whole lot going on at 10 laps right oh man that was a long one especially them starts and then the the yellow with the flat tire and all, it made a long race out of it. <laughs> you're gonna make, I'm sure you're going to make some changes after getting bounced around like that on the chassis, huh? Well, we're going to have to go with a little bit harder tire, and uh, hopefully we can get her to come off a little bit harder, and we'll be about in there, I'd say. Good deal. Well, I hope it works for you. Thank, Thank you. you. For sure. Hey, there's a new line for it, Yates. It's not how fast, it's how far. And here's the incident Jack was talking about in case you just joined us. Watch the yellow car on the left-hand side of your screen. That is Steve Laney. Now, he gets stabbed right there in the left front wheel. That turns him into the wall. And here comes Hewitt. He makes contact with Laney. Jack Hewitt was able to get back into the restart and ultimately transfer to the feature. Not so lucky Steve Laney. He was sidelined for the day. Let's go to Brock Yates with Tim Green, who nudged Laney. Well, Tim, that was kind of the race that wouldn't end after a long haul for you. Yeah, it was kind of a bad deal. We were a little bit loose, and I got sideways coming down the front straightaway, and Steve Lane was trying to pass me on the outside, and I got him in the fence. It was kind of a bad deal, but, you know, I had to track, so it's just, you know, something that's just one of those racing deals. I mean, I feel bad for him, but uh, the wind's blowing pretty hard. It's making it kind of tough. Uh, the feature's probably going to have some wrecks in it, too. I just hope that, you know, it's not a bad deal, and I just hope the race goes good. Sure. Uh, you uh, you didn't seem to have a whole lot of punch in the race car. It, uh, I was watching it on the starts, and uh, Sammy just seemed to be able to pull you coming off the corners. Was that a question of just being looser, or was it the engine down a little bit? Oh, I think the motor's running okay. I think we just missed on the tires and the uh, chassis combination a little bit. I was pretty much the way we were yesterday, and with the wind blowing, it's got the car acting a little bit different, so we got to make some chassis adjustments to compensate for it. But, you know, the motor's running good. If we get the right combination, we'll be right there, hopefully, but, you know... We were there yesterday for about 10 laps till the tire went away, so I have to wait and see what happens to me. But I start 12. I don't know. Well, we hope it hangs together for you. Good luck. Thank you very much. All right, they're getting ready for the start of the consolation in heat number four. The man you just heard Brock talking to, Tim Green, finished second to Mark Kenzer. Jack Hewitt, grateful for a third place slot. Ed French, well, he'll be in the consolation. He did not get into the top four. And there is Sammy Swindell in the number one car. Boy, has he got his work cut out for him, as you said, Steve. He's got to be in the top four to transfer to the main event. And this is no easy field. Tim G., the Canadian, is on the pole. Dave Bradway Jr., always a strong runner. Sammy Swindell, of course, Jimmy Sill, popular and fast Californian, is in the country. Right. And uh, Sammy is not even near the front. He's back in row three, so he's got some fast guys to get by. There's Sheldon Kinzer and Rick Hood, Randy Kinzer. Hey, and there's Steve Laney. Steve, I thought he was out. Well, I believe he is, Brock. They've got him lifted in the constellation here, but that car was pretty bent up. They lifted him. He had right up to the last minute to join the field if he could. Yeah, I sure don't see him out there in that jumble of cars. As they're still under the pace lap, I think they're going to get the green, though, as they come down in formation down the back straightaway and off that little sweeper in turn three and four. So Tim G is on the inside of the front row on the ball, and it is G with a hammer down. G will lead him down into turn number one. Side by side, Joe Clay, 11A, and Jay Bradway Jr. fighting it out for second. Well, look at this, Sammy Swindell in the number one car, right in there. He's gonna challenge Joe Clay in the 11 car right now by him, so he is moving up. There is Tim G still leading it right behind him. Bradway Jr. and in the third spot is Joe Clay. So Sammy Swindell, as we've said before, has got to move up at least to fourth. You heard his car on say, maybe we can use this county to our advantage. All right, Swindell is in the fourth spot now. If he can hang on to it. Well, not only is he gonna hang on to it, Steve, he's gonna nip past Randy Smith in the third and probably start to challenge Dave Bradway Jr. in that 3L car. They're really starting to smoke the tires coming off of those turns. All right, there's the race for the lead. Jim G, followed by Dave Bradway Jr. in the 3L car. But right behind them, the old pro, Sammy Swindell, slowly moving in. But Bradway right now is giving Jim G all he wants for that lead. 
Swindell is just an artist behind the wheel of his sprint car. It's a pleasure especially to watch him pick his way through a pack. Well, he's going to put a challenge on these guys. Probably right now, he's making sure that that race car is handling. Notice the smoke. Uh, that is not oil smoke or exhaust smoke. That is just rubber smoke. These cars are really hooked up on this racetrack now. And the more rubber on this racetrack, in some ways, the better for the feature to come. Right. But right now, the tire wear has got to be excessive, especially for Bradway. Bradway has just put all that weight transfer out of that right rear, and he is getting heavy tire wear. Look at this. A little bobble there by Tim G down into turn four, but he does hold on to the lead. But notice Swindell on every lap, a little closer, a little closer. Underneath now, he looks as if, yeah, he got Bradway. Beautiful move by Swindell off turn two. But Sammy has got to be thinking that right rear tire problem he had earlier, he's got to conserve it a bit. Well, he's going to go for the victory. Right now, he's got assured of a spot in the main event, but he's just going to drive past Tim G. G cannot hold him off. There he is, your leader, Sammy Swindell, charging to the lead from his sixth place starting spot in this race. And now that he's out in front, hopefully he'll be able to back it down just a little bit to finish. Good race for second, though. Bradway and G still after each other, as they have been right from the green flag. But uh, so far, G has been able to hold him off. Bradway sliding hard in that fourth turn, going all over the racetrack trying to get around G, but he's just not uh, able to do it. And in the final transfer spot is 7X Randy Smith. Randy is uh, just going to sit back there. I'm sure he's not going to try to challenge anybody because uh, his opportunity will lie in the feature race. So. Now that they've kind of stabilized their position, the last lap coming up, if Bradway is going to do it, it's going to be in the next two corners. Well, we heard uh, Sammy Turner and Raymond Beetle say, sometimes running the country can work to your advantage. And I think Swindell has learned something about track conditions here. He's sure off to the checkered flag. It should be quite a shootout between that man, Steve Kinzer, Brad Doty, Ron Schumann, and the rest of the outlaws. The feature is coming up. Well, we got us some hardcore, happy sprint car fans here in Mesquite, Texas. They just saw Sammy Swindell win the B feature. He's in the main event. Now let's go to Steve with the man on the pole. I'm with Steve Tenser on the inside of the front row, the pole position, as it were. And Steve, everybody's talking about tire wear. Some drivers even wanted a stop at the middle of the race to replace tires. The outlaw officials say no. How does that affect you? Well, uh, we got the hardest thing I got on. Uh, they're making a dirt car tire right now, so... Uh... If we can't go, I don't think anybody can. Uh, a lot of it depends on uh, there's other, some drivers can get around a little smoother, like Bobby Allen, and won't get as much tar wear. And, and you know, you got guys like me that's probably a little harder on right rear tires, so uh, I'm normally got to run as hard as I can. I'd like to, yeah, I hope it works. Okay, let's go to the outside of row number one and Brock Yates. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. I'm on the outside of the front row here with uh, Ron Schumann, the 21X. Uh, Ron, the way that qualifying has started to uh, run here today, you haven't had a whole lot of track time. Some of the other guys have been running all afternoon, and you've only had a couple of hot laps. Well, uh, it saves me a tire bill. I, you know, <laughs> if I had to run qualifying in heat races, I'd have probably burned up a couple extra tires. But um, hopefully it'll be, uh, uh, the car will be pretty good just the way it is, and uh, we're, we're ready to go. A lot of guys are worried about tires. They're worried that uh, 30 laps uh, just going to tear them up real bad on this racetrack with this heat and a, and a hard surface. Well, it isn't so much the hard surface, but it isn't smooth. It's got sheets foot holes in it. It's kind of rough, and it doesn't get any rubber down, and uh, and consequently your your footprint of your tire is never completely on the racetrack. So um, it it makes it uh, to where you're loose all the time, and it's going to tear up a tire where most other places this this dry would be okay with a softer tire. We're worried about the hardest thing we can get. Okay, well, I hope it works out for you, and good luck. Thank you. Okay, and now let's go to Steve with a third-place starter. Brock, we may have a problem here on Brad Doty's car on the inside of the second row. Brad, you've got a leaking valve stem in it appear, something like that? Yeah, it's just a bleeder valve that uh, lets the air out as the tire gets hot, gets pressure in it. It's, uh, we just keep trying to get adjusted right now. I can hear it hissing right now. Uh, how important is that valve? Well, it's, you know, it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's letting air out, but it's, unfortunately I'm out now and, and uh, the tire is cold. The only thing I can hope for is once we get rolling uh, that we can keep going and we'll have a lot of yellows and then maybe it'll, it'll, you know, even though it's leaking air, the temperature will keep the air in the tire. Well, they still got a few moments. I hope they can get it fixed. Yeah, I think they will. Okay, again, let's go to Brock Yates. He is on the outside of the second row. Well, Steve, I'm with the man who's going to start on the outside of the second row. The man who got uh, second quick time here in qualifying, Bobby Allen. 
Uh, Bobby, it looks as if you've got not a brand new fresh tire on that right rear, but a cured one, which uh, may be a little bit harder compound. Is that why that decision was made? Well, what it is, it's a hard tire, but also what we did, we had a little warm-up there, and you want to scuff these tires in because we knew they were off too fast. So yeah, it is a little bit better deal to do. You know, it makes the tire, it, it cures it, and then it doesn't, you take a fresh tire and go right out there, it burns it right off. Okay, so you got a, a real rough racetrack and a, and a hot one, but uh, are you worried about tire wear in a 30-lap uh, race like this? Yeah, I'm worried about it because uh, Sammy ran the same tire. Of course, there's a new one in the B race, and he burned it off, so they went to a harder compound which him and Steve's the only one that has right now because this tire truck didn't have any more. And I'm, uh, so I'm gonna run kind of conservative to try and save the tire and stay with them and hope that uh, maybe they lose the tire. Okay, well, good luck. Hope it works out for Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, starting in the next row is Shane Carson and Joe Garrity. But back in the fourth row are two very, very familiar names in this, kind of, in this world of outlaw racing. Two brothers. And Steve is with perhaps the most famous of the two. Steve? Rocky Wright, Sammy Swindell has been a big story today. And Sammy, I'm sure you feel a lot better right now than you did when you came in with that slash tire in the heat. Yeah, well, that was just something that, uh, you know, we haven't done in probably two or three years, and it just, just happened today. We, we cut one right right in a tread, and uh, you hardly ever do that. Your brother was telling me that sometimes that extra track time, if you can win the B-Main, uh, is worthwhile, and you kind of got some momentum going into the A feature. Well, that helps because uh, we come right off the racetrack and we kind of know where it's at and what's going on. But uh, the hard part's going to be passing. A guy can really hold you up here. And, and uh, you know, to pass somebody, you're going to have to be hard on your tires. You, a guy out front can just sit there and ride and, uh, you know, really save the thing. So it's going to be tough to pass, but um, maybe we'll have an edge. Maybe the car will be just right when we slip right under them. If anybody can do it, you can. Good luck to you, Sammy. Okay, thank you. On the outside of this same row is Sammy's younger brother, Jeff. Well, Steve, I'm with Jeff Swindell. He's going to start in the eighth spot, and I'm sure that uh, you're a little concerned about tires. Everybody else seems to be talking about them, Jeff, but uh, not much you can do about it, really. Well, uh, especially uh, we're running the Hoosiers this year, and, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're just getting back into the deal, and uh, we're just about the only one on the Hoosiers. Uh, it's, it's not as easy because you can't walk over and see what the other guys are running and how they're wearing. And, and it's been five races ago since we've been on the racetrack. So it's a really big difference in the tire deal because uh, you can get some of the drummer the same and stuff like that. But the wear is, is totally different between a Goodyear and a Hoosier and the different types of tires. So uh, uh, I think we've got the right choice. I, uh, I've run these tires over at Ascot a couple of weeks ago and they seem to work really well. We were really fast over there. but. Uh, you know, it, it is a big guessing game. Eighth spot is back here. I'd rather start on the front, but uh, if we did our work, homework right and uh, got things right, we'll be there. You know, we got a good shaver motor running good and good gambler car, you know, and <laughs> and uh, I'm wrenching the thing and, and driving it. So if you we can't even good, blame anybody else but yourself. <laughs> if, if, if we do good, it's, it's because I worked hard. And if we messed up, it's because I did something wrong, you know, but uh, hopefully we can pull this thing out. While everybody's concerned about tire wear, this man, Brad Doty's problems are compounded by a leaking bleeder valve. We'll be back for the final Outlaw shootout. It should be a good one. A 4x4 sprint car pace lap here at Devil's Bowl. I'm Brock Gates along with Steve Evans. And believe me, those guys are going to pair up and take the green flag for a 30-lap feature race here. $8,000 to the winner, over $20,000 in total prize money, and you can be sure the fans are waving them on. They're about ready to go one more pace lap, and then we'll have a start, Steve. This is the outlaw salute to that crowd. Now they'll form up more conventionally in uh, two-by-two rows. I think they had a start of four-by-four. Four. <laughs> well, we've seen some pretty wild action on two-by-two two starts. Remember? that Steve Laney crash, and uh, that's a tight spot on this racetrack. Uh, we've had some close calls, and of course, Laney uh, did not make the feature probably because of that. So there's Sammy and Jeff Wendell side by side, a big field and a strong field. You know, a lot of experts here, including some of the outlaw officials, Ted Johnson, really like Bobby Allen because of that hard tire you two talked about. Yeah, Bobby Allen uh, really has made a sneaky little deal there to put that... Uh, tire on. Everybody else, is, as far as we know, is using a fresh tire, a very hard compound. Now, remember in the 
B main, we saw a lot of tire smoke, just like a, a dragster uh, pro stocker coming off the corner, just uh, hooked up so hard. And starting dead last is our friend Jack Hewitt, who's come back from all kinds of adversity today. On the front row, Steve Kinzer and Ron Schumann, as we have got a green flag start. Down the front, straight away they come, and we've got big trouble. That is Jack Hardenchild, upside down, a couple of nasty spins, and more trouble in turn one. That's Dave Bradway Jr. and Jeff Swindell in the 91 car all hooked up down there. But the serious problem is right here in turn four, right on the front straightaway. That is Jack Hardenchild. No injuries in turn number one, Brock. Uh, Jeff and Dave Bradway Jr. both appear to be okay. And oh, what a relief. Out of that sprint car to the roar of the crowd comes Jack Hardenchild. What a tough little guy. He is indeed. He kind of took a couple of quick moves there just to tell everybody, hey, I'm all right. Don't bother. Uh, throwing me in the back of that ambulance. Let's take one more look at this and possibly see what triggered it. First, we see Houdenstall wipe right up on the back of Randy Smith's car. Then Bobby Davis Jr. gets his nose beneath Houdenstall's car and ultimately it catapults the front end of that car 20 feet in the air. You see the wing take some of the shock out of it. It almost landed back on its wheels were it not for that left rear coming in contact with the wall. And amazingly enough, Brock was talking earlier how tough these cars are. It's not all that badly bent up. And fortunately, neither is Jock Hodges' child. Let's go down to the pits and see if Brock could get a word with it. Jack, you all right? Yeah. You take a, what happened? You got up against the fence? Yeah, just uh, got front end caught with somebody else and just uh, took off. You're okay, though? Yeah, yeah okay. no problem. Again, another look at this spectacular accident. It looks as if possibly the number six car, Bobby Davis Jr., may have pushed Houghton Child into the back of Randy Smith's car, and then Bobby Davis Jr. is still involved in actually flipping the vehicle. What punishment that man took. He's got to be in very good physical condition to walk away without uh, as much as a limp. Well, if that had been an Olympic diving competition, I think he got out about a nine on that one, Steve. That was about a half gainer with a twist. But fortunately, no damage to Jack Houdenchild, and, uh, but he will be out for the day. All right, remember now, just a few feet further down the racetrack, we had another incident as the green flag dropped, and that involved Tim Green down here in the blue and white number five car trying to squeeze underneath Dave Bradway Jr. Now, Green made it, but Bradway got bunted into Jeff Swindell, and they rode up over each other's wheels and just uh, came to a halt. Now, it appears that neither of the cars are badly damaged, and they've both been hauled to the pit. Well, here is Jeff Swindell working uh, on mounting a new tire. These are what they call knockoffs. You just spin that nut on it, it holds the wheel on. So apparently that was uh, Jeff Swindell's only problem. Well, here is Dave Bradway Jr.'s crew. They are working on his car as well. It also doesn't seem to be very badly damaged. Probably make a tire change and check that suspension setup to make sure that they haven't knocked anything out of Kilder but uh, he's going to climb back in and restart. In the meantime, Jeff Swindell has about completed his repairs. Steve is down there with Jeff to find out exactly what happened. Jeff, no damage other than a tire wheel? Yeah, kind of bent the front wing up a little bit, bent a wheel, cut a tire, tore the hood up a little. That's about it, really. Not the first time. Yeah, it's just one of them deals. Okay. He'll be back in it. Remains to be seen, however, how well the car will handle. Boy, there's a cool customer. And meanwhile, right next to him, Brother Sammy has come into the pit, taking advantage of this little break in the action to make some final suspension adjustments. You can be sure he's going to be a factor in the feature coming up. Remember the accident at the start of the feature just a few minutes ago that took out Jock Hodgenschild? Well, car number six, Bobby Davis Jr., has been put at the back of the pack, penalized, in other words, for apparently causing that yellow flag, Brock Gates. Well, you know, Steve, they just put in that six-foot uh, retaining wall along the front straightaway this year. It narrowed up the racetrack considerably, and it may be that the guys just aren't used to coming off turn four quite as uh, tight as they were. And leading the pack down for the green flag, Steve Kins, a white number 11, orange, 21X, Ron Schumann. Everybody looks as if they got through turn four all right this time as they stay. Look at this, Schumann out front. Got wide, though, coming off the turn two, and there it goes. Kids are out in the lead. Oh boy, this could be dangerous, but Kenzer gets out in front. The winningest outlaw ever. A quarter of a million dollars last year, a million dollars in career earnings. In the meantime, at the back of the pack, Steve, Dave Bradway Jr., Bobby Davis Jr., and Jeff Swindell, they were involved in that first lap caution. They are going to have to fight their way all the way through the pack. But up front, remember what Sammy Swindell said about if you're leading one of these things, how much easier it is when you're
you're trying to pass people, you use your tires up a lot more. Well, right now, Sammy Swindell, sitting back there, he started in the seventh spot. He's going to have to work his way through the pack. And to make matters worse, Steve, he's fallen back a spot. Now he's sitting in eighth. Yes, he is, working on seven eight Randy Smith, who is in the seventh spot. But a three-way duel for... position. 18, Brad Doty is in third, and coming up on him is 1A Bobby Allen from Pennsylvania. Shane Carson is in the fifth spot. Well, Shane Carson is uh, right in there, but uh, Bobby Allen working on him really well. Bobby Allen, as remember, he's got that tricky tire on there, and it looks as if everybody is just kind of stabilizing right now. I don't see anybody really running too hard, and it could be they're going to let this race unfold for maybe 10 or 15 laps before they really start to step on the gas. I agree with you, Buck. And apparently the bleeder valve was working fine on number 18. Yep, Brad Doty is running well. There's Brad Doty, and right behind him, that's Bobby Allen in the 1A. Allen, though, trying to get past him. The Pennsylvania driver, two Pennsylvania drivers, for that matter, both of them coming out of that very quick Eastern Pennsylvania circuit. Brad Doty now in one of the best new cars on the circuit. Got himself a really good ride this year. Now, Bobby Allen is known as a driver who likes to ride low. He doesn't go out of the rim if he can help it. See, he hugs inside pole there, trying to get around Doty. He'll stay down there. A guy who does it all, builds his own cars, builds it for other people as well as own engines. He can just do anything that's required in sprint car racing. Well, and like a lot of young men now coming into racing, he's a former go-kart champion. And, uh, and we know that there are a number of other guys that have moved out of the go-karts into the big time. All right, those two guys hooked up, really running very, very evenly, but Brad Doty, for the most part, able to stay in front of Bobby Allen. Let's see what happens when they get up on some lap traffic here. They're not that far away from it. Right, Brad Doty just sideways through turn one. Beautiful moves on those sprint cars. Now we're starting to see that rubber smoke again. And that means tire wear, believe me. Okay, there's Brad Doty, 18. He is still in that third position. Bobby Allen has lost a little ground on him now due to that lap traffic. In fact, that's uh, Rocky Hodges giving him a little bit of problem there. Rocky not running quite as well, although he challenged briefly Bobby Allen as uh, Bobby tried to get through and passed him. Well, still, that duel continues for the third spot. The blue car, Bobby Allen chasing down or trying to chase down Brad Doty in 18. Boy, look at that tire smog. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Remember now, Steve, they're going uphill into turn one, and that may be where they're really low. Now, right rear tire. Lee Brewer spins, and Brad Doty almost collected him. We've got a caution. Boy, good work on the part of Brad Doty. A lesser driver would have just T-boned one ass Lee Brewer. Brewer just seemed to spin all by himself. Another driver from Memphis, Tennessee, and a very young driver to boot. Now, watch this, especially 18, Brad Doty. Doty coming into turn number four with Bobby Allen right on his nerf bar. He sees Lee Brewer's bend, so he did have some advance warning. He's just trying to figure out where he's going to go. And Doty, boy, did he shave this close. Whoa! <laughs> he sure did. And uh, uh, take a car out of a really 100-mile-an-hour broad slide like Doty was in and uh, straighten it up and then steer it around that spinning car really took some depth and really clever driving. Okay, there's your leaderboard under caution. Kinzer and Schumann right together in one and two. Brad Doty, who almost got collected, he's back in third place, and we got a green already. All right, let's see if Ron Schumann can run with Steve Kinzer. Kinzer out front. Orange 21X and Schumann in the second spot. As they thunder down in to turn number one, that's Kinzer out front, then Ronnie Schumann. Sammy Swindell, the red number one car, is still in eighth position. He's got his sight set on 5M Tim Green and number four, Joe Garrity. Swindell getting by a lap car right there and now has got Garrity firmly in his sights. Garrity the number four car with the yellow wing. Well, right now, Steve, it looks as if Swindell is just stuck in the pack. He doesn't seem to be going anywhere. I mean, Garrity's running uh, very much the same way as uh, Sammy. You wonder whether or not that chassis adjustment he made uh, during the caution uh, meant anything. There he got by Garrity, but that isn't any big deal. Joe's a good driver, but he's got a long way to go to catch up to the leader. And here's Bobby Allen just blows right by Brad Doty. Where does that come from? Good move by Allen. He just took a shot at him going into third. Uh, the 
third turn, and there he is. Now he's sitting in the third spot, and Doty, I wonder if Doty's got some tire problems because now he's dropped back a little bit. Well, Bobby Allen is mounting a charge now. You were talking about Swindell earlier, Sammy. I've seen him race many times, Brock, and watched him pace himself until about the last 10 laps. That could be what's going on here. Well, that may be, but uh, he's got a long, long way to go. Doty is now falling well back. I wonder if Brad, uh, that uh, bleeder of Alvin, has now lost enough air that he has uh, got himself a soft right rear tire. And I'll tell you what, Bobby Allen continues to close on the tire smoking orange star of Ron Schumann. Schumann's in the second spot. Out front, though, number 11, Steve Kinzer, just hangs on, driving a typically smooth race. Uh, but uh, right now, the show is Bobby Allen. And notice that there is no tire smoke off of Bobby Allen's car, or very little. That's he right. keeps it down low for better tire wear, and he's got that hard, pure tire. Well, he doesn't seem to be pitching it into the corners quite as hard as everybody either, which loads, of course, that right, right rear tire, the outside tire. But the big question is, can Ronnie Schumann hold him off? I don't know. It doesn't look like it. Here's Ooh. Allen down where he likes to be, a little bit lower than his uh, adversary. It is Bobby Allen. Yes, he's in the second spot. Boy, he is hooked up. Look at him. Now he's just driving away from Schumann now that he got underneath him. I wonder if he can reel in Steve Kinzer. I'll tell you what, he's not that far behind Kinzer, and Kinzer is faced with a whole lot of traffic. He could do it. Well, this is where it really gets difficult for the leader. He's got about six or eight cars. He's got to thread his way through as they go out of turn two. And Allen made some nice passes in there. And he's got about, oh, what, 10 feet behind uh, the leader. And Sammy Swindell Brock has now moved all the way up to the fourth position. Now, Swindell has got cockpit adjustable rear gas shocks on that printer. That could be helping him. Look at that tire smoke in turn two. That has got to be just like asphalt there. There goes Kinzer trying to get under a slower car, and Allen right on his tail. Kinzer, number 11, is in the lead. This is the kind of action that packs the stand everywhere the outlaws go. Kinzer staying down low, trying to weave his way through all of this traffic and doing a brilliant job. Well, you remember earlier in the race, uh, in the heat, everybody was riding up high, up on top. But now they're hooked on that inside rail on the bottom. Oh! oh Kinzer gets bumped. Kinzer is pushed high. They're going to get underneath him now. Kinzer lost about six spots. Fell way back there. Allen is your new leader, and Steve Kinzer, flat guarantee, he is hot. And that was number three, Danny Smith. The bump Kinzer up off of the racetrack. Boy, I wouldn't want to face him in a pitch when this is over. <laughs> Former Indiana State wrestling champion, he's the bad man to tangle with. And that has shoved him all the way back to the fifth spot. Boy, the guy who's fun to watch right now is Sammy Swindell. He has pulled out all the stops. An artist behind the steering wheel of a sprint car. Look at that. He just nerfed Brad Doty right out of the way. And now he goes after Ronnie Schumann. He made a move that would make any New York cab driver proud. What a piece of traffic driving. And now Swindell's got his sights set on 21X. That's Ronnie Schumann. But now Sam also has to deal with Steve Kinzer right on his rear bumper. Oh, yeah. What a race. Right now, though, Bobby Allen has just said goodbye. He's moved well out into the front. Nobody's really watching Allen right now because all eyes are just glued on the one car of Sammy Swindell. You know, Bobby Allen has done such a smooth job of taking command of this race. I think half the people in the stands think Swindell is leading. Look at this. He is moving past Ronnie Schumann down underneath off of turn four. Sammy Swindell has taken over second place. And remember, it was me who said I thought he was stuck back in seventh. Well, I'll tell you, this is the last lap. So Swindell, the best he can hope for here is second. Bobby Allen is going to win it coming out of turn number four, car 1A. Bobby Allen wins the devil ball. Sammy Swindell is going to take the second spot. And Steve Kinzer just does get under Ronnie Schumann to salvage a third. Well, it's really hard to win a World of Outlaws feature race in kind of quiet fashion, but that's what he did. All the thrashing and banging, and Bobby Allen just drove through it all to win. We'll talk with him and the other high finishers right after this. The Outlaws lived up to their legend at Devil's Bowl today. When Ford's came to shove, they did both. Bobby Allen, a very smooth performance, wins it. Sammy Swindell, spectacular in coming from the middle of the pack to nab the second spot. But let's take a look again at the incident that may have cost Steve Kinzer this race. 
Well, this is turn one, Steve, as uh, you see Allen down inside in that blue 1A car, dive to the inside, but right there, the number three car of Danny Smith just brushes wheels with the leader, Steve Kinzer, in the number 11 car. There you see Smith's car coming out there to set up for turn one, and that is Kinzer up against the fence, and he literally got bunted up into the loose stuff. There, down on the inside goes Allen. Allen on the inside, where he'd been all day long, used that to advantage to take over the lead. Steve Kinzer recovered to take third. So, a tough break for the man from uh, Indiana, a good break for Bobby Allen. What a classic outlaw fight, right down to the very last lap. Congratulations, Bobby Allen. Thank you, I appreciate it. It's just good when you win on these races. It's fun when you beat some good guys. You know, Ted Johnson, the president of the outlaw, said Bobby Allen will win this because he's running a cured right rear tire. Well, that helped, and I saved it for a little bit. I didn't race till about 20 laps to go. I stayed back and just kind of rode behind because I knew he was gonna burn them, and then I was hoping they'd start losing them, and it looked like that happened to me. Well, Kenzer had a handle on it, then he got wide, a few cars got underneath, and then Swindell started to move. Yeah, yeah, well, I didn't see Swindell, but I did see, uh, I seen Steve, I was getting him, and he got in the lap traffic and got screwed up, so just made it a little easier. $8,000 payday, not bad? Yeah, everybody be happy. <laughs> Bobby Allen, what a fight. Let's go to Brock Yates with the second place runner. Sam, I'll tell you what, that was one of the greatest comebacks I've ever seen. It was fantastic. I thought you won it, but you just couldn't quite run him down, huh? Well, just run out of time. Them guys were a little anxious there to start, and they, uh, we had some tires that was going to make the race, and uh, I just was waiting on my tires again, and the guys, uh, a couple guys slipped by me right there on the start, but... Uh, After the first caution, it looked like you fell back a little bit. I was, I thought maybe you made a little chassis change. I thought maybe you, you, you got the car wasn't working so well. Well, we had one guy slide under me, and he got me up out of the groove, and a couple guys got by, got by and it uh, put me back to about eighth or ninth or 10th or somewhere, and, you know, and it's, just, it's just hard to come from back there and win a race, but uh, you know, we were definitely the fastest car at the end again, but uh, we just got held up at the first and got back too far. Well, you did a fantastic job. I'll tell you what, the folks were romping and stomping up there. It was a great show. We're sorry you didn't win it. Yeah, well, thank you. Okay, Sam, super giant. And now let's go to the man who had the tough break in this race. Well, Steve, you said before the race, one of the keys to winning was going to be to stay away from that traffic you'd have to lap. Well, uh, he just uh, got into against Danny and uh, got me out in the loose stuff. When he did, it put me back to about fifth, and he's lucky to get back up and run third, so uh, I get this part of the race. And well, all the uh, horror stories about tires uh, proved uh, to not really happen. Everybody seemed to be in pretty good shape. Well, everybody was pretty well just like myself, was taking it easy on him, maybe a little bit too easy. Uh, I had enough rubber left. Uh, I could run hard in the last few laps, and maybe I should have been running a little bit harder and not been having anybody quite that close, but uh, uh, my mistake today. Well, sorry to see you put out that way. That's uh, our congratulations to everybody, Steve Kinzer, and in particular to Bobby Allen, who won it here today at Devil's Bowl. Well, they may call themselves outlaws, but we find them to be perfect gentlemen and some of the most exciting racers on this planet. When the outlaws come to your town, go see them. To recap the final results, Bobby Allen from Pennsylvania wins it. Tennessee and Sammy Swindell in the second spot. From Indiana, Steve Kessler. From Arizona, Ron Schumann. From Ohio, Brad Doty. For Brock Yates, I'm Steve Evans. So long from Devil's Bowl. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Pallet. Produced and directed by John D. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by the Style Auto World Championship Team, the nation's premier source of fast lane fashion. Style Auto, the champion's choice for the style of your life. The American Sports Cavalcade is a free...